everybody, this is Eve Ewing. I'm the curator of the Black Freedom Lecture Series. And before we get started with our amazing talk this week, there are two things I wanna remind you to do. The first thing is if you are not already signed up for our newsletter, you definitely wanna do that. It's how you're gonna find out about all of our incredible speakers and enter a raffle to win books and find out about questions and readings and all the cool stuff. So go to our website, blackfreedomlectures.org slash newsletter and sign up if you haven't done that already. The second thing is we would really love this to be a collective learning experience. So if you haven't done so already, we encourage you to get together with a squad, a group of friends, or just one friend, hook up with somebody and say, hey, I'm watching this thing, I'm reading this stuff, and I would love to have some conversations with you about it. Get together so that this is not a thing we're doing alone. Um, that's it, welcome, really geek to have you, and let's get into it. Hi, my name is Alice Monk, and I'm an Associate Professor of Sociology at Harvard University. And what I'll be discussing today is colorism. Typically, when we think about racial inequality in the United States, lots of the statistics that we see every day in the news, quoted by politicians and experts, use census data. And this data, at least since 1970, has been based solely on self-identification. So people receive a census form, as you can see here on the slide, and they're asked to self-identify as one or more of these categories. Uh, at least since 2010, you can check more than one of these categories. And when we think about the category Black, one thing that we have to keep in mind that I'll be talking about a great deal today through the lens of colorism and skin tone is all the heterogeneity and the diversity among the large population, millions of people who self-identify as Black. And this complexity was already pointed out way back in 1895 by W.E.B. Du Bois in his study, The Philadelphia Negro, where he explicitly warned that there's always this tendency to homogenize Black people. That is to kind of ignore, to wipe out to obscure all of the heterogeneity and diversity among all the people in this country who self-identify and are identified by others as Black. And when we think about skin tone and colorism, this is a really key source of heterogeneity and diversity among Black people. For instance, if we think about some of our key figures in the civil rights movement, someone like Walter White, co-founder of the NAACP. You can see his picture there. One of the things that he was rather famous for doing was passing for white throughout the South. You can see how he looked there. Uh, and by passing for white, phenotypically appearing as he did, he was actually able to infiltrate different lynchings and to report on these lynchings, uh, places that of course, common sense would tell you would be very hostile to anyone who visibly appeared unambiguously to be Black. In the middle of the slide here, I have a picture of Katherine G. Johnson of uh, recent fame uh, for the movie Hidden Figures. Diane Nash is there as well. We have a picture of Bliss Broyard, who wrote a book about her father, Anatoly Broyard, who famously also passed for white. And this idea of pass for white only really makes sense in the context of a country where this category black not only refers to people who have darker skin tones, certain types of hair and eye colors, but also people who for all intents and purposes really are phenotypically indistinguishable from people identified, self-identified or ascribed to the category white. So when we think about colorism and kind of this brief historical perspective, we really need to go back to slavery and we need to think about some of these privileges that are afforded to people based on the lightness of their skin really go back to kinship ties that were had with whites during the period of slavery going all the way back uh, to before the United States of America even existed as a country. We're talking all the way back to the beginning. And here we're thinking about how people who were directly related to whites, and of course, sexual violence was a key uh, part of, you know, having this mixed race population back in that time period. These people were lighter skinned, they had kinship ties with whites, and on average, they were the ones who 
had higher rates of education, they had higher chances of being freed, higher chances of learning a trade, working in the house, all these sorts of privileges that over time, even after slavery ended, as I'll explain today, have persisted, okay? And one kind of aspect of the history of colorism is also keeping in mind that not only did whites practice this preferential treatment based on the lightness of the skin of certain African-Americans, but also other light-skinned Black people practiced things like homogamy, where they would only marry other mulattoes, other people with lighter skin tones, and other forms of social closure as well, which was uh, a method of pr uh, protecting this light-skinned privilege that they had in their families. Uh, and there's even some research that shows that given all of these advantages uh, in the 19th century in even the 20th century that lighter skinned people, mulattoes, African-American men of mixed heritage were actually even taller on average because they had access to better healthcare and nutrition and all kinds of different things. And when we look at the history of the US census even, today we kind of take for granted, a lot of us do that we have a black category of a white category, Hispanic, et cetera. But if we look back historically to our US census, even the census recognized these gradations of ancestry. So you had multiple categories on our US census going back into the 19th and early 20th century that represented, that referred to all of these gradations of ancestry and of phenotype among African Americans. It was only in the turn of the 20th century, really the 1920s and 1930s, that we had this aggregate category, just one category for all Black people to belong to, regardless of their mixed race ancestry, their phenotype, et cetera. And you can see on the slide there, I have a picture of W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey, and they were really uh, strong fights, lots of contention over the definition of blackness itself and who should legitimately be able to refer to themselves as black given the history of all of these privileges afforded to people of mixed race ancestry and lighter phenotypes. And Garvey was very uh, different on this kind of uh, approach uh, to an aggregate category than say Du Bois. Uh, du Bois won the day in the sense that he argued quite explicitly for all black people to come together, regardless of their skin tone, their phenotype, their ancestry into one category. And this was one way of thinking about this is accepting what's known as the one drop rule. And without going too far and too deep into that history, because it would lead us astray, uh, one thing to note about that one drop rule, this idea that just one drop of black blood or black ancestry is enough to count you as black, uh, this was something that was fought over. And if we look at the United States, different regions of the country uh, came to accept this rule uh, at different time periods. In Joel Williamson's book, New People Talks, a great deal about this. Uh, arguably, as he puts it, uh, in some parts of the South, they never really fully accepted the one drop rule. They kind of always had an intermediate category that kind of marked the social, economic, and political differences uh, among Black people based on their ancestry and their phenotype. Okay. And even today, uh, when we can mark one or more categories on the US Census, uh, that's usually not the case. What most people do in line with arguably the one drop rule and its very intense legacy in the United States is that people will self-identify solely as black. And Barack Obama is one uh, common example that people point out uh, as evidence of this typical practice. And there's lots of research that shows that this tends to still be the case that people who do recognize that they have multiple ancestries still tend to, if they are black and say white, will identify solely as black. And what that means then is that even today, some hundreds and hundreds of years after slavery, uh, we still have a situation where we have this aggregate black category to which people of all different types of shades and colors belong to. And that means that there's immense heterogeneity in how people look within this category. Some people will be very dark skinned, some people will be kind of in the middle of this continuum, and some people will be so light 
that they will be able to pass for white, essentially, okay? And as a sociologist, I'd like to point out that social science used to pay a great deal of attention to these gradational differences in color. And I have some examples of some excellent work uh, by black sociologists that focused a great deal on these color hierarchies and skin tone. But arguably, as we've moved from the beginning, the first half of the 20th century, all the way into the 21st century, one thing that I argue in my own research is that unfortunately, focusing on the continued, the unceasing significance of skin tone and colorism, I think has somewhat waned. And my research and, and my efforts are uh, really aimed at trying to make sure that we're still paying attention to this and even making the argument that we can't fully understand racial inequality without understanding colorism and skin tone stratification. So what do I mean when I say the unceasing significance of color? Well, this is something that I think we should all be thinking about very seriously, which is there's this much social economic inequality along this color continuum from very light to very dark skin as there is between blacks and whites as a whole. And certainly this is a counterintuitive way of thinking about things. Uh, but what I'll be doing in the rest of this lecture is kind of walking you through different results from my research and the research of others that really points to the fact that there's this much skin tone stratification, there's this much colorism inequality, colorism related inequality in this country as there is between blacks and whites as a whole. And this means that I think when we think about racial inequality and when we think about race, if we do so without taking skin tone and colorism very seriously, we're only getting a piece of the puzzle. So for instance, if we look at inequality in education. This is a hot topic, a persistent issue in the United States when we think about racial inequality. One thing that I've shown in my research, for instance, is that if we look among black people and white people, typically that's the, the canonical comparison. How are black people doing in education? How are white people doing in education? If we use statistical methods and data, nationally representative data, we would find that on average, whites have 10.2 months more education than black people, okay? That's a big gap. But if we were to just look within the black population in terms of skin tone, we find a gap between the very lightest and the very dark skin African-Americans of 15.4 months. And what this is showing is that there's actually more educational inequality just among black people along this skin tone continuum as there is between black people and white people as a whole. And if we look along different points of the skin tone continuum, we can make different types of comparisons. So if we compare say white people as a whole, like the average to people who are in that very light black skin category, we see a gap there of only four months. But if we were to compare, say, white to people in that very dark skin category, that disparity in education is 19 months, okay? So again, if we're not taking skin tone and colorism into account when we think about racial inequality, we might have actually somewhat of a rosier picture than what is going on in practice, which is that on the one hand, you have these differences that you can produce between say the average white person and the average black person, but there's all this heterogeneity among black people and skin tone matters a great deal when we're looking at these inequalities in terms of education. And as I'll mention, as we go forward, the criminal justice system, health and the labor market among many other different things. Now, one thing that was really clear, I think, uh, in research in the first half of the 20th century when we're thinking about colorism was how skin tone was also really important in terms of marital patterns among African-Americans. This idea that when black people were getting married, light skin, particularly among African-American women, was something very valuable in the marital market, right? This idea that some people were quote unquote color struck, that they would put a value in skin tone when they're looking for a mate. 
And one thing that I found, this is data from the beginning of the 21st century, so this is recent data, is that if we look at African-Americans today, really, we can still see evidence of this. So what all these numbers, what this particular uh, chart is showing from, uh, this table is showing from one of my published papers, is that if we look at African-American women, those who have lighter skin tone tend to marry black men or marry men, regardless of their race, uh, who have a full year more of education than darker skinned black women. Again, this is showing this persistence, this unceasing significance of skin tone inequality, even in marital patterns among African-Americans in the 21st century. Now, if we look at the criminal justice system, we typically get these kind of black white comparison statistics, right? And you know, these are some of the well-known statistics. I put a few of them up on, on the slide here. So for instance, if we look at say one third of young black men, uh, age 20 to 29, they were in prison or jail or probation or parole on an average day in 2005. We know that there's large disproportionality by race in terms of the probability of having ever been arrested or incarcerated, sentencing. There's all kinds of studies that show this. But one thing that's pointed out by some social scientists is that education, which I just referred to a few seconds ago, thinking about skin tone and education, is also a really important predictor of contact with the criminal justice system. So some people will use these types of statistics. So just to kind of walk us through this really quickly, the probability of incarceration for African-American men without a college education is 12 times higher than that of African-American men who went to college. And if we look among whites, that disparity is even larger actually. So the probability of incarceration for white men without a college education is 16 times higher than that of white men who went to college. So some people will look at these statistics and they'll engage in this debate over race versus class uh, without getting into that kind of thorny, thorny bramble. But again, some people will look at this and say, well, it's not really race, it's class. But looking at skin tone among African-Americans, I think really disabuses us of this idea that it's as simple as just class disparities. And I'll walk us through how to think about that now. And this is based on some of my own published research in this area. So if we were to just look at a comparison between say blacks and whites in terms of who's saying that they've ever been arrested during their life. And this is nationally representative data again. What I find is that 36% of African-Americans say they'd been arrested at some point compared to only 21% of whites, nationally representative data. So that kind of fits, I think, uh, with our intuitive kind of commonsensical understanding of racial disproportionality in contact with policing, with the criminal justice system. But if we look among African-Americans along this skin tone continuum, what we find here is there's a disparity between those who are very light and those who are very dark. And in fact, that disparity, 24%, say versus 40%, is as large as that gap between blacks and whites as a whole. Once again, this inequality is just as large among African-Americans as it is between blacks and whites as a whole, right? And you can see that difference between whites and very light skin African-Americans is really, really small. It's only like 3%. It's reminiscent of the smaller gap, right? Between say very light-skinned African-Americans and whites in terms of education. So one way of thinking about this race versus class debate in terms of contact with the criminal justice system, as I point out in this paper, is that what I'm able to do focusing on African-Americans and taking their education into account is still find this skin tone effect, this skin tone residual. And what this shows along this kind of spectrum of very light to very dark skin African-American men is that the probability of having been arrested is just goes straight like a line. The darker you are, the more likely you are to have been arrested at some point in your life. And this is even after I take your education, your income, what part of the country you live in into account. And this suggests then that there is 
this marker of race that is playing a role, as many of us, I think, believe when people are encountering police, when they're dealing with the criminal justice system. And this is something that's not reducible to just an educational difference, because as I said, I'm taking education into account when I do these statistical analyses. So just to think really you know, quickly here, education, there's inequality among black people in terms of their skin tone that seems as large or maybe even larger than what goes on between blacks and whites as a whole. In arrest, criminal justice contact, we see a very similar thing going on. Okay, so in each of these two really important domains that we care about a great deal, skin tone matters a lot and it matters today, not just in the past, not just like a thing of slavery that we got over. No, it matters today and it matters in a really, really large way. And one way of thinking about why it matters, uh, social psychologists are really good at pointing this out, are the kind of stereotypes, the kind of cognitive biases that people have in terms of phenotype, such that people who are darker skinned are much more likely to be perceived as dangerous, less competent, less attractive, negative traits that go back for hundreds of years, these kind of cognitive biases, these stereotypes that aren't just about belonging to this broad racial category, but are fine tuned down to just how black or how white someone appears. And in the literature on colorism, a lot of the time we refer to the privilege of having lighter skin and having kind of less harsh stereotyping or even positive traits attributed to you as a proximity to whiteness, at least as perceived proximity to looking white. And in a society where you have this value for whiteness, a white supremacy, right? That means that people who are able phenotypically to appear more white are treated better, not only by whites, Asians, et cetera, but even by other African-Americans, as I'll point out in the next part. And this is just a really uh, infamous uh, study done by Jennifer Eberhardt and her colleagues. And it just really kind of drives this point home again, this idea, this idea of stereotypicality in your appearance, how black you appear to be in terms of your facial features, your skin tone and all these sorts of things. And I have the finding there on the slide. And what they found was that the darkest skin, most Afrocentric appearing black defendants were twice as likely to be sentenced to death in these different trials, right? Again, pointing out how these cognitive biases that are held by the judges, by the prosecutors, by the jurors, by people living in this country that have this system of race uh, stereoty uh, stereotyping and colorism deeply into their heads to the point where it can even be unconscious uh, are leading to these types of effects. So one domain that I write about a great deal is health. So if we think about health disparities uh, in the kind of typical way that we see in the media, you'd get these comparisons between black people and white people, right? And one thing that we know uh, is that there's big differences in physical health and mental health even uh, between blacks and whites. So for instance, one statistic that is rather dated, but I think it's something that's really striking and these numbers haven't shifted that much uh, is that black male youths in 1980 were less likely to survive to the age of 65 than male youths in Bangladesh. It was as if black men uh, in the United States lived in a different country as it were in terms of the healthcare they received, the social stressors that they were up against right? The things that were affecting their health negatively. And if we look at more recent data, we find that there's a five-year gap in life expectancy at age 25 between Blacks and whites. And with COVID and the pandemic, these numbers are likely to get even worse. But this literature on health disparity does have a couple of puzzles that it confronts when it compares simply between blacks and whites. So one thing that we know is that even after we take education, income, health behaviors into account, we still see health disparities between blacks and whites. And these health disparities between blacks and whites are sometimes not even as large as the health disparities we see just among black people, this heterogeneity, this diversity among black people. 
okay, again, this is pretty surprising, but uh, there is evidence that shows that differences in mortality, differences in mental and physical health, there's as much heterogeneity to be explained just among black people uh, as there is between blacks and whites as a whole. So how do we get a grasp on how we think through these substantially significant within race inequalities in health? And in my research, I've done, through, done so through the lens of color. So if we think about skin tone, we think about color, one of the things that, you know, based on what I've been saying throughout this lecture, uh, is this idea that people who are darker skin may face harsher and more frequent forms of discrimination. And discrimination is a form of social stress, which research has shown is negative for our mental and physical health. So if we do research that takes this into account, we may find that some of this within race inequality in health is really down to these skin tone differences among African-Americans that predict different rates of exposure to different um, types and different kinds of forms of discrimination. So in one study I did, again, using nationally representative data, I found that as skin tone increases in darkness, we see that people perceive more discrimination in their everyday lives. Now, this may seem like something that should be obvious, but what was striking to me at the time when I had done this paper was how few papers were able to even do this type of analysis because as I said earlier in, in this lecture, usually when we think about racial inequality, the types of statistics that we have available to us are only using census categories. So that means that they don't really have data on what skin tone someone has. They don't have interviewers sit down with a palette or something and really like, okay, you say you're black, great, black, and ask you know, where you work and all these sorts of things, but they also rate your skin tone so that we know more about the social experiences that people are going through that are much more complicated than simply being black or white or whatever category. And what I also find here is that lighter skin respondents perceived uh, dramatically less discrimination than, right, than darker skin African Americans, which means that we should expect to the extent that discrimination helps us predict these disparities in health, that lighter skin African Americans would have better health, mental and or physical perhaps, than darker skin African Americans. But I'm going to complicate this a little bit as we go forward. Now, when we think about discrimination, right, and how typically it's measured in social science, there are lots of different measures of discrimi uh, discrimination. But one measure that people like to use is everyday discrimination. And what I was talking about before was an everyday discrimination measure, which is not really building in attribution. It's not asking necessarily why you think you were the target of discrimination, but it's just asking you, do you feel as if you were discriminated against, okay? But we can also ask people specifically about colorism, perceptions that they were treated differently based on the color of their skin. And this is distinct, say, from racism. This is distinct from like everyday discrimination. And what I was able to do uh, really for one of the first times in the literature is to look at perceptions of colorism. So here I have uh, some basic findings. So we asked, uh, the survey asked people, nationally representative again, how much discrimination do you perceive from whites based on your skin tone? And we found there that people who were darker skin perceive much more skin tone discrimination from whites than those who are lighter skin, which is totally what I think we would expect, right? But colorism is not just something that goes on, but say between blacks and whites or between blacks and people in other ethno-racial categories. It's something that also goes on among African-Americans. And what I was able to do in this study was also take a look at the unique uh, health consequences of intra-racial skin color discrimination, okay? Now, what I find there is that intra-racial skin color discrimination is actually distinct empirically from all the other types of discrimination, meaning if I put them in the same statistical model, that intra-racial colorism sticks out, it has its own effect on health. And this form of discrimination, I argue in my work, is likely to be extremely damaging for health 
because it's something that happens within that same group that a lot of people look to for solidarity, for support. This is a form of discrimination that's going to take place among people in their friends, right? Among their families, uh, with their spouses, their loved ones, right? This is something that's really close to home. And to bring Du Bois into this one more time, I found this really interesting quote that I think is going to be important as I explain this next part, where he talks about his reluctance to actually date someone. Here we go with the marital patterns again. But he was afraid to date a woman who looked too white, as it were, because he thought she would be discriminated against. Okay. And Du Bois being mixed race, being lighter skinned himself, here he's pointing to the idea not simply that being darker skinned is something that's stigmatized, but also this idea that an African American could be perceived to be too light, that this could also be something that leads to discrimination among African Americans. And what I was showing in this published paper and if you Google my name, Ellis Monk, uh, you go to my website, you can get access to this paper. But what I find is that among African-Americans, perceptions of skin tone discrimination, perceptions of colorism do have this curvilinear, this U-shaped distribution to them where people who are very light and very dark skin perceive much more colorism among African-Americans than those in the middle of the skin tone continuum. And that means that when we want to look at direct relationships between skin tone and, say, different health outcomes, uh, it's actually pretty complicated. Because one thing that I find about intraracial colorism and th is that it's a really significant predictor of health. Okay, And that means that to the extent that this form of discrimination is a strong predictor of health, that means it goes in different directions. So we might not really find this simple relationship where say darker skinned people have worse health than lighter skinned black people. That might not really be the case. There's a little complexity there because what we see is that African-Americans are facing discrimination on multiple fronts simultaneously. And this colorism, this intraracial form of it is really important for health as well. Okay. And if lighter skinned people are perceiving it at rates that are similar than darker skinned people, then there's this kind of flattening out effect in terms of skin tones, direct relationship with health, health outcomes. Okay. And one thing to kind of signal here is that this finding using recent data, this is really recent 21st century data, really goes well. It really lines up perfectly with what social scientists uh, were talking about, how colorism worked within uh, the so-called black community way back in the early 1900s, even before that, this idea that lighter skinned people were also targets of discrimination uh, within the black population, okay? So this is something that's a well-known dynamic, but what I've been able to do in my research is put some numbers to that and then to show the health consequences of this complexity. So as I kind of move to the next domain where I think colorism is really important, which is the labor market. One thing I'd like to say here is that when we typically think about labor market outcomes, again, we get this kind of black white comparison. Uh, you know, lots of us have probably seen in the news, we've seen politicians, experts talk about the black white race gap uh, in earnings, this idea that on average, white people will earn more money. Uh, than Black people, even after we take their different types of occupations into account, their education, that there's this remainder, this residual for race, right? And what I was able to do uh, in a recent study, and this is a forthcoming study, uh, so this one isn't quite out yet, but it's been accepted for publication, is to take a look at colorism on the labor market. But in this paper, I do so in a little more complex way. So as I move towards the end of the lecture, one of the things I'd like to point out is, you know, a lot of us have heard about this theory of intersectionality, this idea that we belong to multiple categories, there's multiple forms of disadvantage that affect our lives simultaneously. One thing that we know about skin tone in the United States, at least intuitively, right, is that skin tone is a marker of beauty perceptions of beauty are racialized and they're gendered. So what I've done in this kind of recent study is to try to look at 
the interrelationships between skin tone, gender, race, body size, all these different forms of inequality that interact together and give us more complex patterns than just simple black white dichotomies in terms of labor market outcomes. <clears throat> so one thing to point out, similar, I would argue to what I said with education, to what I said in terms of health and the criminal justice system, is that within category inequalities are large. That means just what goes on among black people, that inequality within that heterogeneous population can be as large as what goes on between blacks and whites as a whole. But how do we begin to explain these types of within race categories? And what I've done in this particular paper uh, is to look at skin tone, but to also not just look at colorism, but to look at something called lookism, this idea that how you look, these perceptions of beauty, physical attractiveness that are racialized, that are gendered, affect how much money people make, what kind of jobs they can get, right? It affects life chances. And there's an economist that's really famous uh, for doing this type of work. And in the book that kind of summarizes this work, he argues that the effects of beauty within the black population might actually be smaller than what goes on among whites. But he says he doesn't really, he didn't really have data to test this. Uh, but what I've done in this paper is use data that's able to test this. And what I find is that actually the effects of beauty, skin tone, colorism, lookism, body size, this intersectional approach to the labor market is actually larger among black people than it is among white people. So as I've mentioned, right, briefly, to the extent that perceptions of who is beautiful are racialized and gendered, right, that racial inequality, racial stigma play a role in who's held up as beautiful or not, uh, then we should expect that there's an unequal distribution then along racial and gender lines. There's an unequal distribution of this notion of beauty in the US population, okay? And this is precisely what I find using nationally representative data where respondents were just asked to rate the attractiveness of the different people they were talking to, mostly white uh, interviewers, by the way, even though we don't really find different effects. Uh, that beauty hierarchy is really well entrenched uh, and there's lots of intersubjective agreement regardless of what uh, race someone belongs to. And this is what we find here. This is just kind of showing this um, disparity where black people and black women in particular are receiving lower scores, right? This idea that gender and race are really affecting the types of scores in terms of uh, perceptions of attractiveness, not objective, there's no objective, but that people who are black are seen as less than in terms of their physical attractiveness, right? And this is all the more the case for black women in terms of stigmatization around their skin tone and their facial features and their hair. So what I was able to do is to, even after taking almost everything you could think of into account, someone's education, the prestige of their occupation, all these different factors into account, we find large gaps on the labor market in terms of how much money people are making in terms of perceptions of their physical attractiveness. And it's so important, these perceptions, these subjective perceptions, even though there's a lot of, of uh, agreement around these perceptions, and that is in and of itself uh, a mark uh, of white supremacy and the forms of ethno-racial domination in the country that are, and in the world globally, uh, that kind of set up these beauty hierarchies. But these disparities are so large, in fact, that we see among African-American women at the highest levels of perceived attractiveness, their income starts to cross over, starts to converge with that of white women. So that beauty can be this kind of great equalizer almost. It's that important for women and that important for black women, these perceptions. But of course, we know what this is also signaling, and I talk about this in the paper, is colorism, because one of the key predictors 
of these perceptions of attractiveness are skin tone on the one hand and body size. And skin tone, above all, it's just really, really strong predictor of these perceptions. So what we're seeing here in these, these findings is not just like lookism, but we're seeing colorism on the labor market. And if we were to kind of break this down and compare the importance of colorism and lookism on the labor market to a black-white comparison, we actually find that among Black women, that disparity along this continuum of physical attractiveness, this gap between those on one side and those on the other is 45%. But that's larger than the standard black-white race gap, which in most data sets is 13. It's larger than the male-female, this black, this uh, gender gap in earnings, that's only 30% by comparison, okay? So what we find here is that the magnitude of social stratification associated with colorism and lookism on the labor market in the United States is actually somewhat larger than just thinking in terms of the race gap or the gender gap on the, on the labor market. And as I point out in this paper uh, that should be out sometime this summer, uh, lookism in a lot of states is legal, right? It's not protected by our civil rights legislation. Even skin tone, uh, historically, and I talk about this in a different paper called The Unceasing Significance of Color, which is an uh, open access journal named Dataless, uh, the civil rights legislation doesn't even perfectly handle color as distinct from race, this idea that colorism and racism are two different things. So in our legal frameworks, how we imagine inequality and how we imagine justice, color and looks, lookism, don't totally get the attention they deserve and to the extent that they don't receive this scrutiny, to the extent that lookism is legal, that you can discriminate on the basis of someone's physical appearance and their hair, their skin tone, their facial features, and beauty, these notions of beauty, these subjective notions are racialized and gendered. This is a way to maintain racial inequality in the labor market. So one thing to kind of, as we draw this to a uh, conclusion that I point out in my research is that we're not just thinking about colorism, even when we're thinking about colorism. We're thinking about the body as a form of capital. We're thinking about how people are treated differently on the basis of their physical appearance. And standard census categories don't necessarily do justice to all this heterogeneity. And this isn't just a U.S. problem. This is a problem all around the world, even outside of the typical black-white dichotomy, even outside of the context of slavery in an African-European dynamic. We see skin tone as a marker of status in Japan, India, which has a massive skin lightening industry, Nigeria, this just on the African content itself, and Nigeria is not alone, again, a very large and robust skin lightening industry, the Philippines, now, certainly colonial contact with Europe, with the United States plays a role in some of these cases, right? But it's not always the main factor. So when I talk about Japan, I talk about China, right? It's not necessarily U.S. colonialism, at least not historically. You could argue that today it plays a role, and certainly it does, but we can trace the value people place on skin tone to periods far before these sorts of contacts, right? So one other aspect of my research that I'll talk about uh, in conclusion here is tapping into this kind of global aspect of skin tone stratification of the idea that the body is a form of capital that people place value in. And that's the case of Brazil. Now, Brazil never had a one drop rule and it has multiple racial categories. And I have a picture there of their census. But a really similar dynamic plays out in Brazil as occurs here in the United States. So we think about skin tone and racial inequality in the Brazilian case, and we think in terms of education. What I find there, again, similar to the United States, is that if we just looked at the census categories, we look at who self-identifies as black, who self-identifies as white, and Brazil has an intermediate category, brown, okay? If we look at those disparities in terms of census categories, we find what we would expect to find, which is that whites on average have higher amounts of education than say blacks, okay? 
But if we look within that black population, right? And we look at skin tone rated by interviewers, we actually find much more inequality just among people who self-identify as black, which in the Brazilian census context would be this brown category and the black category, as there is between blacks and whites as a whole. Now, if we look at the Bra entire Brazilian population, instead of using the racial categories, because in Brazil, they never had the one drop rule, uh, some 30 to 33% of whites openly claim having some form of black ancestry. If we look just among Brazilians as a whole and we look at skin tone, we actually find much more inequality in terms of skin tone than we do in terms of racial categories. And this is a statistical way of looking at this. And what I'm able to show here is that even after we take the census categories into account, it's really skin tone that's predicting how much inequality there is in the Brazilian population in terms of education. Uh, and in other research, I'm able to show this in terms of occupational status, what kind of jobs people have and income. So again, in closing, I want to really signal to all of you that colorism is something that's persisted throughout US history. It's something that's a global issue. And when we think about cases like Brazil, which are arguably closer uh, to the historical pattern of the United States with slavery, uh, with the black white uh, racial hierarchy. In each of these cases, skin tone is really important in patterning life chances and outcomes. And if we just think in terms of these dichotomies, if we were to just aggregate people together, we actually miss all of this heterogeneity, all of this diversity within and across these categories in terms of skin tone. So when we think about racial inequality, we can't really do so comprehensively without taking skin tone and colorism into account. And what that means then, if we were to think about race in the Americas, it means that what we have in both of these countries and really throughout the Americas as a whole, is a pigmentocracy, not just a society based on racial categories and racial difference, but based on pigment, okay? So I'd really like to end with the idea that not so much that skin tone and colorism are opposed to racism, that they're totally different things, right? And that we can focus on colorism and forget about racism, but rather that color matters because race matters. Skin tone and color are signifying racial differences, okay? And that's why they matter, okay? So race is mattering, color are mattering, and they matter together, okay? And by paying more attention to color, that means we'll be paying much more attention to how race works. And this is a form of inequality that if we don't pay attention to, it will continue to persist. And our discourse, I would argue, doesn't pay quite enough attention to the unceasing significance of color. Thank you.